Hey, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about cookie hijacking. It's also called session hijacking. It's one and the same thing. This is going to be one of the biggest malware issues that people are going to deal with probably over at least the next couple of years alongside things like ransomware. This stuff is pretty bad though because if you get infected with this, it's a huge pain in the ass to clean this stuff up. Now there's been some higher profiles examples of this happening like the Linus Tech Tick channel when that got hacked. That was an example of a cookie stealer. I watched a recent video from one of the YouTubers that I follow, they had one of their social media platforms get taken over by a cookie stealer. And it's also happened to other YouTubers and other people with social media platforms. It's happened to people that got this stuff on their computer and it, they got all of their crypto stolen. So we're going to go through all of that. What you need to do to protect yourself, the things that you need to look out for for this stuff. So let's go and jump right into it. So the first thing that we're going to cover is how this stuff actually works, like how it works behind the scenes and also how you can get infected with this stuff like the way that it's being spread right now. So a cookie stealer or a session stealer, whatever it is that you want to call it, it's one and the same thing. What's going on here is that it's, so when you go to log into websites is, I'm sure people that follow the channel already know this, but you have cookies that are put on your computer and they're stored there. Now you can go and clear these cookies out. And that's what I would recommend to people unless you really need the convenience clear out the cookies from your browser every time you're done doing whatever you need to do clear the cookies clear everything out before you close the browser out or you can also usually set it in settings to where it deletes everything as soon as you close the browser one of the issues with this malware and there is an exception to this that i'll cover here soon but one of the issues with this malware is let's say you have google chrome installed for example or brave or something like that and so you always stay logged into let's say your gmail account and somehow you click on a file that has cookie stealer malware you're not aware of it it's able to run in the background your antivirus doesn't catch it well, now they have your cookies. And the thing with this is it doesn't matter if you have two-factor authentication turned on. If they get your cookies, they have access to whatever it is that you are logged into. So that means things like Gmail accounts. There's a YouTuber who, by the way, this YouTuber that we'll talk about here soon, their account is still hijacked after six or eight months and there's malware that is actively being posted on this channel. I don't know why in the hell YouTube is allowing this. They still haven't taken care of the issue, but it's one of the big issues with this stuff because it's a pain in the ass to clean up. And a lot of times you're just going to lose your accounts. The thing, so the other thing that I want people to be aware of when it comes to banking, if you get your cookie stolen and you get your bank account drained, you are very likely not going to get your money back. This was something that I was curious about. So I was looking into the issue. And from what I could find is it looks like people, because there are multiple news stories, they're run through local news stations. So you have to use a little bit of Google searching to find this stuff. But there are some articles that are running through like local Googles or through local news stations where people were getting hacked and they lost money. And the bank was like, okay, well, tough shit. You got hacked. You probably probably should have had like better security practice, whatever their excuse was. So just because you have your money in the bank doesn't mean that it's going to be safe if someone gets a hold of it that way. If you get your crypto hack, obviously that's going to be gone forever. And the thing is like, even if you have a hardware wallet, if this stuff is sitting in the background on your computer and you don't know about it and you go to access like your hardware wallet, well, they can steal your crypto. This happened to people as well. They've had their crypto get stolen from malware. And obviously with crypto, there's no way you're getting that money back. I mean, people have lost a lot of money doing that or having that happen. So let's go ahead and cover here real quick what it is that's going on behind the scenes here. So this malware can get on the machine in a number of different ways. These are just a couple of examples here. So there's like cross-site scripting, which is where you have typically it would be like malicious JavaScript that's running on a web page. I've talked about this a little bit. We're going to go over how to protect against that. I'm not going to go super in depth on that one. This is the one that we're going to focus on right here is the downloads aspect because this is what causes a huge amount of the issues. Now, this comes in a couple of different forms. So you can get this stuff from going to what you think is a legitimate download site. You're downloading what you think is legitimate software. Maybe you're going to a shady file repository service. One of the things that I recommend people stay away from is, is file repository websites. Whenever you need to download software, go directly to the source. And then it's also becoming very popular through email now, which we will cover some stuff from Leo at the PC Security Channel. He's covered this a little bit, so we'll get into that here shortly. But email is becoming a very popular method. The other thing I'm going to mention with email, I know this was a thing for quite a few years where people would talk about, oh, well, hackers... You know, they send out shitty looking emails that it's really easy to detect that 
it's just a fake email. And I'll show you a video from the PC Security Channel that you can go check out, but they're getting very crafty with this stuff. And the thing is, is it's, let's say it's someone that English is not their native language. What they can do is go to something like ChatGPT and ask ChatGPT to fill out like some sort of an email saying, hey, I need you to write me an email. I'm looking to sponsor a person, sum up one of their videos or give me a slight description of their videos in the email to make it sound like I'm writing this email legitimately. That's what they're doing. And so these emails are getting really, really really good. Like what you'll notice with these, and this almost happened to Leo, is where they're sending out what looks like legitimate things like sponsorships, but this could happen to you being a home user. You could be doing business with a bank or something like that. Someone finds out that it's a bank, you know, through like a data breach or whatever. They find out like a list of services or whatever that you use, and then they craft phishing emails around that to get you to click on some sort of a PDF or click on a link or something like that, you download this session stealing malware, and now you lose access to your bank account, you lose a bunch of money, you lose access to your Gmail account, and it takes weeks or months to get all of this stuff cleared up. Now, if persistence is kept, this can affect the user until the antivirus detects or the user figure out what's going on. So here is what I mean when I say that. This is especially through if the if for some reason the antivirus doesn't detect it right away because a lot of times there won't be a signature for this stuff usually it's like a new piece of malware that doesn't have a signature associated with it so this stuff can run in the background and if it's built in with other stuff like you could obviously disable your antivirus and you wouldn't know it, it can cause a whole bunch of different issues and then you wouldn't figure it out until all of a sudden, well, you can't log in your bank account or all of a sudden you have a whole bunch of transactions or money being transferred out of your bank account before you kind of start piecing together what it is that's going on. So it's really important that this stuff doesn't get on your system in the first place because if your antivirus doesn't detect it, there's no way for you to know about it until it's too late and all of your accounts get taken over. And chances are, if it's just sitting in the background, they're gonna wait until you've logged on to your bank account, your Gmail, all that stuff, and then they'll start accessing shit. Now, social media, so I've talked about this a little bit with sending out those emails. Social media is be, it's basically about the most effective way to transfer this stuff. And social engineering has become like the main way of spreading malware now, whether it's ransomware, or session stealers, or any number of other pieces of malware is social engineering. Because like I said, emails are getting very convincing these days. It's not like the, the old days or even just a few years ago where you used to get really crappy looking emails and it was very easy to tell what was going on. They The scammers have really stepped their game up in recent years. And it's a lot easier to trick someone into, you know, like send an email or something that's well crafted. It's a lot easier to do that now. And so this is the route that a lot of them are taking rather than trying to get people to download download some weird thing off of a website. I'd say that a lot of people still have at least somewhat a good level of knowledge of what it is that they need to avoid downloading or places to avoid going to. But if a person is talked to in a way that seems really convincing, then that's a completely separate issue there. So like I mentioned, it's gonna be a pain in the ass to clean this up if this happens. So like reformatting windows is, for example, would be the least of your issues. That's going to be like the fastest thing because things like, you're probably not ever gonna get back a Gmail account or anything like that if that happens if it happens to your bank account it's going to take months to go through all the issues dealing with getting your accounts restored like i said you're probably not going to get your money back anything like that so let's go over this is the really important part so let's go over the defenses if this the any part of the video you're going to watch if you've been skipping stuff around this is the one part of the video to make sure that you watch because there is a few different things here they're really important. So first of all, if you're on Windows, and what I recommend is using Defender, if you wanna use third-party antivirus suite, that's completely fine. I don't care if people use that, completely up to you. I think Windows Defender works great, especially when you harden it properly, and that's what we're gonna cover here real quick. So I made a video recently talking about Configure Defender. I think it was just a few weeks ago. That's what I put in the title was something like Configure Defender. I would recommend just going and watching that if you want a full breakdown of how this works. But with this software, what I would recommend doing is if you're going to use just Windows Defender, set this thing to max settings. I know that there's warnings and stuff about how it's going to cause false positives and all this and that. It is extremely rare that that has ever happened. I've only ever had it happen a few times and it's really easy to come back in here if you're trying to run a legitimate piece of software and it's being blocked. 
It's really easy to just turn down the settings temporarily, but it is incredibly rare that I've ever had an issue with a piece of software. It only comes up maybe once every couple of months where I'm trying to do something that's legitimate. So running at max settings is really good because it turns up Defender a lot. And by the way, I'm just gonna mention this real quick. Defender is not foolproof. No antivirus is ever foolproof. Things can still go bad, but this is a very good way to help prevent stuff from going bad. One of the things that can help you a lot with this in particular when it comes to session stealing malware. So I've talked about how a lot of it is usually like a fresh sample that gets sent out to people. And so there's usually not a signature through antivirus for it yet. That's how it can get past a lot of antivirus is then you're having to rely on heuristics to be able to catch the malware. And if the heuristics doesn't catch it, there's no signature for it, then it's allowed to run on the machine. One of the things that can really help with that is this setting and configure defender, which all this does is change things in group policy and through registry keys. This is just a GUI to do it. Is block executable files from running unless they meet a prevalence age or trusted list criteria. So what this does here, before it will let you run an app on your computer, is it needs a digital signature for the trusted list criteria, or which are, there's a verification process to this, which it works well enough. But the prevalence and age is really good to have because it has to be at least 24 hours old and it has to be installed on at least 1,000 different Windows machines or it gets blocked. Now, I've only ever had this happen a couple of times. Like I'll run, try to run a legitimate piece of software and it gets blocked based on this criteria. Usually, so like one of the last examples that I gave when I was talking about this was the Molvad browser. They had just pushed out an update for this like maybe 20, 30 minutes prior to me trying to open this. So the browser had updated automatically and then all of a sudden Windows Defender blocked it because not it had not yet reached that threshold of the 24 hours and then a thousand people using it. So where you don't have signatures or anything like that, this can prevent you from running like some sort of an executable on your machine. So it's very handy to have this. And then like I said, just turn the stuff up to max. If you're going to do that, one thing I'd recommend is just disable you're going to leave controlled folder access on, but this stuff, Microsoft still has a lot of improvements to make on controlled folder access. So it's it'll be a while, but otherwise it works very well. All right, next thing, showing the hidden file extensions. This is something that is extremely important, not just for things like cookie stealing malware, but for everything you should have this. I don't know why this is still a default to hide this on Windows. Now, if you click up here on, if you just go to File Explorer and then click up here on the these little dots and then go to settings and then go to view here you can just click show hidden files folders and drives here's the reason why that's important so i've got a pdf file sitting here in this folder now what a lot of this session stealing malware will do is it will try and masquerade so what someone will do is they'll put so it would be like an executable but what they'll do is they'll put configure so in this case like let's say configure defender help.pdf it's actually an exe but what someone can do is rename it to dot pdf and then so you think that and then it, they'll replace the icon to let's say PDF is one example so it looks like because you'll see the file extension oh okay it's got PDF and oh, okay it's got the PDF icon oh, okay well I can go ahead and click on that and then as soon as you do that it's actually an executable and boom now you're infected if you have the show hidden files folders and drives on is it will show you so if someone tries to rename it if it's actually an exe is it would then show like .pdf or .exe.pdf. And that's something that's being done a lot to spread this stuff. Also, the other thing I forgot to mention with Configure Defender, you can block a lot of macros in there. Macros and like PDF files are something that's being used to spread this stuff as well. So you have to be careful about opening up things like PDF files. But that's another method. The next one here is block lists. So that is things like encrypted DNS and Portmaster. So when it comes to encrypted DNS, one of the things that you can do is use a service like Quad9, DNS0, Next DNS, Control D. There's multiple service providers out there. I like Quad9 and DNS0 because they don't require user accounts, they, so that makes them like basically the most private by default. So you just blend in with everyone else when you're using the service. Now, if you want to customize your block lists, then you can go with Control D or Next DNS. But you can come in here and check out more information about their threat blocking. But what they do is they go to these threat intelligence providers, and these threat intelligence providers provide things like a list of malicious domains, malicious IP addresses that gets loaded into their service. 
And then you can do this from either a piece of software. So in this case, you could do it from Portmaster, you could do it from the browser. If you're going to pick one, so you can only pick one or the other. If you try to set, so like, let's say you wanna do Quad9, you set that through your browser and then you set it through something like Portmaster, you're gonna run into issues with loading web pages. Things will like time out, not work properly. So it needs to be one or the other. What I would recommend is that you just do it all through Portmaster so you can set DNS in here. The other thing if the other thing I like about Portmaster specifically is you can load up a lot of other features to block stuff. So you get these built-in filter lists that run on top of something like Quad9. So you're gonna get some overlap, but there's also stuff that comes along as extra. So in that case, like telemetry. So if you have like the telemetry lists enabled, things like when Microsoft, when it tries to phone home with all the telemetry, if you haven't turned off all of the stuff and uninstalled stuff to get rid of that is poor master will just block it because it's going off of all this list of IP addresses of things to block. So for example, here is the list that one of the poor master lists that uses uh, things that they block. So like it says added the one of the more recent updates was added more Microsoft domains as of last month. And you can go in here and click on lists and see all of the different things that get blocked in here. So like if I take a look at telemetry, so it's blocking all this stuff. It's got all of this other stuff built in and then also on top of it. So you can block. So it's got like malware lists, ad lists. So you can block a lot of stuff through here so it's it's good for just going beyond protecting like against some malware or things like that this blocks a whole lot of garbage which just like i said it's really nice to have the other advantage with using something like that is you have a so that's like your first layer of defense so if a block list catches this stuff so like let's say quad nine is it's preventing it from potentially being able to get to your computer and bypass your antivirus which is really important also, if you're a Linux user, you should be using this stuff. Everyone using a computer should have a firewall running. So like that's what Portmaster is. And to an extent, I suppose you could kind of consider something like Quad9 to be a sort of a firewall as well. But these block lists are really good to have. Next thing is going to be uBlock Origin. And people think that this is just an ad blocker, but it actually blocks against more. So like it blocks against threats. So giving you an example. So I had this happen recently where I tried going to a website and I wasn't paying attention while I was typing into the search bar. I transposed a couple of letters. And what I didn't realize is that I was about to go through to a typo squatted website, typo squatting. So let's say you take Google, but then instead of typing in Google, someone's not paying attention and they type three O's instead of two. Now, I don't know if Google owns the web domain where there's like three O's, but let's say that has been typo squatted. Typo squatting is where a malicious actor has control of that because what they're banking on is that, oh, hey, people are going to type stuff into a web browser, the, the search bar, to go directly to a website, and they're going to mistype something, and then some of those people are going to land up on my website that looks just like that, and then I can direct them along and get malware onto their machine. And uBlock, in that case where that happened here a while back, is it warned me ahead of time, hey, this website has been blocked because it's a malware associated website. So very handy stuff to have, like I said, it's not just a ad blocker. The other thing, so like Windows Defender, for example, make sure you're keeping your signatures up to date. These are not reliable. It's not great against session stealers in particular because a lot of session stealers might have a new signature. But if someone tries to send you something that has an, as something that's already had a signature made for it, it's good to have that for your antivirus so it can catch it right away instead of having to rely on heuristics. The other thing is virus total. So you can upload stuff to VirusTotal, which is really good to have. The issue that I'm going to throw out there, so VirusTotal is owned by Google, and if everything that you upload to there, they have access to. So if there's a, let's say a sensitive file that's going to be coming through on your email that you're expecting, and you're like, okay, well, I don't want people to see this, then you probably don't want to upload that to VirusTotal. Like, let's say you want to make sure that that's a good file, but you don't want it to go to VirusTotal. Just something to keep in mind. The other thing is you can spin up a virtual machine, which I would recommend people to have. It's a good idea to actually have a couple of virtual machines ready to go in the background, whether they have Linux or Windows or whatever the case. So if you're on Windows and you just want a Windows virtual machine, one of the lowest friction ways to do that is to just install Hyper-V. It's really easy to spin up and use this. You do have to have Windows Pro to turn it on. They only added this feature into Windows Pro. If you're on Windows Home, you won't have access to this 
Otherwise, you can just use VirtualBox for this. There are a couple of limitations with this. First of all, there is, it's pretty rare, but there is malware that can jump outside of a VM. So don't rely on this stuff being able to sandbox any malware 100%. The second thing is some malware is designed to detect that it's inside of a virtual machine and it will not run. So in that case, it's not completely reliable. Where this would come in handy is let's say, you have some files coming in, but you don't want to risk your main operating system getting infected and you just want to double check. But to have that extra layer of security, what you can do is run it inside of the virtual machine first, scan it inside of there, make sure it's clean. And if everything looks good, then you could transfer it back out to your main computer to do whatever work it is you need to do with let's say someone sends you some sort of a file that you need to fill out or whatever. Now I do wanna give a shout out to Leo at the PC Security Channel. He went behind the scenes quite a bit, so I'm not gonna go break down all of this stuff because he has already done it, but there are a couple of videos in particular that I would recommend. First of all, this video here talks about the malware on large YouTube channels. So the Shook Kitty, this is an example. So this is the channel that I was talking about that got taken over, I think it was six or eight months ago. And there is viruses that are actively being spread through this channel. What it used to be is like an artist's website. Now they're spreading like some sort of crypto malware or free program downloads or some bullshit on here. I don't know why YouTube hasn't taken care of this yet, but this is happening to more than just this channel. Like this is happening to a lot of channels because like I said, what's happening is they're getting things like what looks like legitimate sponsorship emails. They're downloading what looks like a real contract and then they click on it and boom, they're infected. Now all of their shit gets taken over. The other thing that I would recommend you go watch because this was a specific example of a malicious sponsorship faked email was this how not to get hacked real example. This was someone who sent Leo a, and they did a really convincing job with the email where they sent it and were like, hey, we've watched some of your recent videos talking about like antivirus or whatever the hell it was. We'd like to sponsor your channel. You know, here's like terms and here's our conditions of working with you. And they sent what looked like a PDF file, which had a virus and it was a piece of malware stealing software. So I would go watch those two videos if you haven't already seen them to go really in depth. He goes behind the scenes like this one. He opened up like a hex editor and took out a bunch of junk data to show you like one of the things that they'll do is they'll bloat the file up so large that you can't upload it to virus total to get it scanned because they know that a lot of people are starting to do that these days. So if you go watch those two videos and you do the hardening stuff that I talked about in this video, you will be pretty well set up for defending yourself against this stuff. And at that point, what it comes down to is just using good sense when you're using the internet, being careful about like what you're opening up or clicking on or downloading anything like that. So with all that being said, hope you enjoyed the video. Appreciate the support as always, and I will see you on the next one.